weird question for you. Have you ever stopped for a moment and read a section of Scripture and go, what? Why? And not fully understand it? There's several of those. And I'm going to tell you something real quick. There's a few sections of Scripture that pastors love to stay away from when it comes to preaching during worship services. Part of that is time constraints. Part of that is they're really not sure exactly. They've never done the study. They've never delved deeply into it to see what might be happening. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to look at one over the next couple of months when I'm here. Um, we're going to kind of do a long series of sermon uh, on them. And my wife will tell you, I don't like to do those because of my own ADD. But I really felt God's calling us to this. I'm also going to tell you, this isn't going to be those feel-good sermons that you get to rest with for the next week and to think about. It's going to be one that makes you hopefully think a little and delve deeper into your own Bible. I want to talk to you this week in the next couple of weeks about one of the most disputed books of the Bible. And the liberal theologians and the liberal churches hate the book of Daniel. They try to say Daniel didn't write it. They don't talk about the prophecy because it's hard to understand. It's hard for people to think that a young man like Daniel, at the very beginning of his age, would get such great wisdom from God. A lot of people today don't believe in prophecy, projecting things forward, telling about the future. But Daniel too really does begin to delve into that. But before we get too far, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a moment of prayer and asking that He would give wisdom and understanding and that I do what He's laid on my heart, justice and honor. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank You today for Your Word. Lord, and for just that You would be with us today as we jump into the harder parts of Scripture, ones that many times are not discussed except for in mild, simple terms. Help us to understand the book of Daniel, what it meant, what it means now, and what it will mean in the future. Thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Amen. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is why. Why would, should we study this book? Well, first of all, and there's dispute about this, it is a book of prophecy. Things that are talking about, when Daniel wrote it, he was talking about things in his future. Things in our future also. There are parts of Daniel that still have not come true. And so we really need to look at a, uh, this I the Scripture as a book of prophecy. Pretty much in line in Revelation, with Revelation. Now, like I told you earlier, many theologians today will not call Daniel a prophet. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, he's not in the list of the prophets. He's in the writings. Because it didn't match up in length and in depth to the book of Prophets. Today, a lot of Christians will call him a major prophet only because he wrote a lot. There's 12 chapters. It's a very short book. But in the Christian church, they do take the prophets and call them major and minor. It has nothing to do with what they said. It's the amount of writing it comes with. That's right. So if you hear somebody say, well, this is a major prophet and this is a minor, it has nothing to do with the words they said, but the amount of words they wrote. But Daniel in the Hebrew Bible is actually not a book of prophecy. It's just in the writings. But it is a prophetic book. So that's one of the reasons we should look at it. I mean, Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 15, he called Daniel the prophet when he talks about the abomination of desolation. And we'll look at that too in, in time. Let's say we're going to do a, a, a projected study of this. One of, the, uh, one of the things you'll see is that Daniel makes many projections that have literally been fulfilled. 
as we as we begin to read here a little bit, we'll talk about how he predicted the Greek kingdom under Alex, uh, Alexander the Great. Um, he predicted the madman, Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, which you can read about in the Maccabeans, and how this guy came in and set up in the temple of God, on the altar, he set up a figure of Zeus. But it's also not only a book of prophecy, it's a book of ministry. Daniel was living in a very multicultural world. In fact, he worked in the multicultural world. He worked with and spoke to members of the Jewish faith, the Gentiles, Babylonians, pagans. I mean, all of these people. Now, Daniel wasn't a preacher. The man had a job. How many of you ever heard the joke, how often does a preacher work? How often does a preacher work during the week? The joke is he, preachers work one hour when they come to church to preach. That's not true, but that's always the kind of standard joke is if you're working within the church, you're, you're really into, into your brain, you're into studying, you're into preparing, that you don't have a physical job. But Daniel wasn't like that. He had a job. He was, as he grew older, he became almost like the prime minister of Babylon. He had to study, he had to preach, he had, he had to work like a judge and overseeing things. He had a job. But he had a job in a world much like the one we live in today. But the interesting thing is, is as he goes through this, his vision isn't to the people of God only. It's actually to that pagan king. Daniel gets this revelation from God to give to the pagan king. And he does it. It's also a book about spiritual warfare. And we're going to get into all of those focuses over time. But that's the reason. You might think, <laughs> this is why we're doing this. Because I really feel is that if we get delve into this, we might understand the future in which it is pointing to. Because it is coming. We don't know when, but if you believe in prophecy, which if you really read your book, most of this is prophetic. Old Testament, New Testament, it's always talking about the future time when Jesus comes. And God has given us the roadmap. I know uh, Dr. Craig is working on it, but he also gave it in the Old Testament. He gave it throughout the New Testament and on. So we are not deceived when the time happens. So if you turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. It says, In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed such dreams that his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell him his king, tell the king his dream. When they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had such a dream that my spirit is troubled by the desire to understand it. The Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will reveal the interpretation. The king answered the Chaldeans, This is a public decree. If you don't tell me both the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you do tell me the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered him a second time. Let the king first tell his servants the dream. Then we can give its interpretation. Think about this. The Chaldeans, sometimes they're, depending on the translations, referred to as wise men, different things. But they made their living uh, and get paid by the king to speak to the gods. All of a sudden, the king comes. He's had this dream. You ever had one of those dreams that keeps you awake at night? It kind of scares you. 
So all of a sudden this king says, come here, boys. And I'm going to say boys because at this time, these were only men. It was a patriarchal society. But he said, come to me, boys, and we're going to talk. You need to tell me the dream first. Because honestly, if they know the dream, they're going to, especially because they're going to get paid, they're going to give him a positive interpretation. You don't want to tell the boss any bad news, especially if you are in an absolute monarchy. This wasn't a monarchy like England, where they're just a figurehead. Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch. What he said goes, he didn't have any counsel, he had the right to kill, destroy, everything. It was absolute. Pretty much like the kingdom of God. God is an absolute monarchy. And so these folks were scared to death. Any of you ever been called in to tell your boss bad news? If you're an accountant, a CPA, you probably had to tell them that the profits aren't there. Sometimes we, you know, we're taught we have to speak truth to power. A lot of times we don't like to do that. And neither did these folks. So they're trying to get him to tell them the dream. Because they knew they were, they knew in their heart they couldn't. They could not do this. So they're scared. And all of a sudden, the absolute monarch says, you don't, I am going to tear you from limb from limb. And he knew that. And when they couldn't, he began to call for them to collect all of the wise men. Because actually they said in down here in verse 10, it said, the Chaldeans answered the king, there is no one on earth who can reveal what the king demands. In fact, no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king is asking is too difficult and no one can reveal to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with the mortals. Because of this, the king flew into a violent range and commanded that all wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Now you've got to remember, Daniel's only been there a couple of years. As this is the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's just got there, so he's a young man. He's in maybe a second year of training, and he's considered part of the wise men. So <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar's mad, and he's going to call them all in to kill him. Now Daniel, if you continue on to read on, Daniel does something really powerful. Daniel, when the guy comes to get him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes to get him and his buddies, Daniel goes, stop. Look with me down in um, verse, like, I can't even read, about 16 or 15 says, Why is this decree of the king so urgent? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. So Daniel went in and requested that the king give him time, and he would tell the king the interpretation. Young man. Looking at facing death. It's a stop. Hang on. Whoop. Give me time. Trying to buy himself time to live. That's a lot of pressure because this king can do it. And then what's the first thing he does? He goes back. Once they get that permission, he goes back to his home and he informs his companions and begins to tell them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning the mystery of so that Daniel and the rest of his companions and the rest of the wise men of Babylon might not perish. So then Daniel does something unusual. All we know is we're not sure if Daniel was asleep and it was a dream or if it was some supernatural vision as he's sitting there. All it knows is it was a vision of the night. I'm thinking Daniel was so confident in God that he went to sleep. And as he was sleeping, this vision came to him. And so all of a sudden, Daniel, bless God from heaven. He says down in verse 20, Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God from age to age, for wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons, deposes kings and set up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. To you, O God of my ancestors, 
I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power and now and have now revealed to me what we ask of you. For you have revealed to us what the king ordered. Think about this. Daniel asked for prayer, for wisdom and mercy. He gets it. What young man would go, okay, God, I'm going to give you the glory. Most of us would go, I got this. And they'd go in and tell the boss, this is what I did. But Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel immediately gives praise to the God who told him the dream and interpreted the dream. Just as the Chaldean said, only the gods can do this. So all of a sudden, Daniel is going from facing death to having a chance to be a great witness for the Almighty God. So then he goes to Arioch, the Antioch, or Aranoch, the king's man, and when the king had appointed them to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he says, don't destroy the wise men. Bring me in before the king. I will give the king the interpretation. So then Antioch goes in, and they begin to take Daniel up there before the king and says to him, I found one among the, Ju uh, the exiles of Judah, a man called Daniel. Actually, I think he probably didn't call him Daniel. He called him uh, Balthasar. Yeah. And who's able to tell you the dream, and I've seen this in the interpretation. So here's a young man, and he walks into the king of the, king of, the of, of Babylon, an absolute monarch, and he does this. He says, Daniel answered the king. No wise men, enchanters, magician, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is asking. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and has disclosed to Nebuchadnezzar what will happen at the end of days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed were these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be hereafter. And the revealer of mysteries disclosed to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me because of any wisdom that I have more than any other living being, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You were looking, O king, and lo, there was a great statue. The statue was huge. Its brilliance is extraordinary, and it's standing before you. And its appearance was frightening, the head of the statue was of fine gold, and the chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked on, a stone was cut out, not by human hands, but it struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay, and it broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer of the summer's threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain filled and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will tell you the king its interpretation. You see why preachers want to stay away from this? Because it's really hard. It, it might, and it could take a long time to really get into that. But imagine what Daniel must have felt like. <laughs> He's standing before the king, and he gives them this vision that God has given him. Now he actually has to tell them the truth. And I like the way he does this. Verse 36, he says, this was the dream. Now that we will tell the king its interpretation. And you notice he says we. He doesn't say I. He says we. Who do you think he's including? Daniel and God. Yeah. Daniel and God. Because God, Daniel knows that this is, has nothing to do with him. He is just the revealer of the prophecy. God revealed it to him. It's God's revelation. It has nothing to do with Daniel. He just speaks the word. And so he goes on and says, You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, 
to whose ants he has given human beings wherever they live, the wild animals of the field, the birds of the air, and whom he has established as ruler over them all, you are the head of gold. Anybody ever think about this? Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, pagan, unholy, ungodly, and yet Daniel says, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. Here's a Jewish boy telling the pagan God that God has ordained his kingdom. God does ordain unholy kingdoms for a purpose. Nebuchadnezzar never really follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all that, but he uses Nebuchadnezzar he ordained this unholy understand that even God is an absolute. He is the authority. With God, we, we can't change His statutes. We, we can't do any of that. God is. So He goes on. It says, and you, After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and yet the third kingdom and yet a third kingdom of bronze. <laughs> Can you imagine telling a, a, a king, two years into his reign, yeah, yeah, there, there's, your, there's your kingdom, but there's going to come another one. You're not going to be up there forever. Can you imagine telling someone, I guess we can't understand it because we don't live in absolute monarchs. But these people, at this time, when they thought they were kings, they thought they were gods. And they thought that their kingdom would last forever. Daniel has to tell them, no, it's not. There's not, yours is not going to happen. It's going to fall, and that there will be another kingdom. I want to get to my notes here. Hang just a second. It went backwards. So now Nebuchadnezzar begins to say, he begins to understand and know that he can trust Daniel's interpretation. He's seen the dream. He knows the dream. So he can trust Daniel. Now Daniel begins to tell them about three dominating empires that are going to come after Babylon. Now we can tell you now, looking back over history, it's the medo persian Greece, the, the Medo-Persians, I think that's how they call it. Alexander the Great in Greece, and then Rome. Now that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, but then he goes down, the second one is made of silver. Metal Persian was silver. It's a weaker metal. It's not going to stand as strong. It was also not an absolute monarchy. It was an allegory, I guess what they call oligarchy, a mon monarchical allegory. Basically, the nobles and the king were equal. They'd all sit around the table, and much like what they have in England right now. The king sits there, but he's just a head of state. There's the House of Lords and the... Uh, House of Commons, and there's the Privy Council. They all sat there and tell the king what to do. It wasn't an absolute monarchy, so God considered it weaker. And it wouldn't last as long. And then he talks about the bronze. The one which shall rule over all the earth. And if you know anything about Alexander the Great, when he became into power, he went all the way across the world in a short time. Conquering. That's why it's called Alexander the Great. Conquering country after country after country until at a young age he got called back. But he set forth Greece as this great empire. Now, he died fairly young. And then that began to fall apart. Now, the Babylonian Empire stood from the time of this revelation to the time of its overthrow for 66 years. The Medo-Persian Empire lasted for 208. The, the Bronze, the Grecian Empire for 185 years. Then there was the Roman Empire. Most of us know about the Roman Empire. We, we study that in history. The Holy Roman Empire. Anybody know how long that lasted? 
500 years. Now again, this is why liberal commentators don't like to talk about this. Because they don't believe that the fourth kingdom is Rome. They say it's Greece. And the second, third kingdoms are the media and the Persian separately. And so they don't count it as a whole. And they do this because they believe it's impossible for Daniel to predict the rise of these empires in the way he did. Now the interesting thing is, as he goes to the Roman Empire, he begins to also talk about the next kingdom. That in those days, the king of the kings of the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that's the fulfillment of the prophecy that's in the future. And it talks about that stone that's cut, cut without hands and how it shatters the con- confederation of kings represented by the feet of the image. So think about this. Since Roman history provides a fulfillment of this federation of kings, which seem to number about 10 because it's the number of toes, you'll see that again in Daniel 7.24 and in Revelation 17.12. We know that this is in the future. Now, since the fall of the Roman Empire, there has never been a world-dominating power equal to Rome. Many have tried. You've got the Huns, you've got Islam, uh, again, the Holy Roman Empire, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, but none, none of them have succeeded. Each of them has had mating power, they've had influence, but they have nothing compared to what the Holy Roman Empire did. Now, the Roman Empire in some form or another is going to be revived under the leadership of the final fallen dictator. The Antichrist, anti-Messiah, or whatever terminology you want to use. And that's going to be in the future. Now, if you look at these broken pieces, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, this is described a single decisive event that shattered the image representing the glory of man's rule on earth. That's what that statue represented. It's all man. It's all about the glory of man and how they rule and how they do things. And all of a sudden, this stone cut without hands, which we know is the Messiah, not the church, but the Messiah. And you can find that references to this in Psalms 118, Isaiah 8, 14, Isaiah 28, 16, they, and Zechariah 3, 9, all refer to Jesus as the stone. So Daniel, at this time, is beginning to prophesy about Jesus Christ coming. And so we also know then that that final superpower of the world is thought to be a revival of the old Roman Empire and a continuation of the image. That will be the final final worldly empire that the returning of Jesus will conquer. You ever wondered how people begin to talk about that in prophecy? It's because Daniel pointed it out. That's where the ten nations come from. How many toes will we got? Ten toes. So if there are ten tones here that are smashed and divided up and then restored, that's the Holy Roman Empire. Well, my watch is buzzing telling me it's quarter after. <laughs> so um, we're going to continue on. We're going to continue on, like I say, looking at about all of the book of Daniel as a rule. But I want you to understand, this is why it's hard for pastors to talk about this. Because a lot of people today, they want to come into church, they want to feel good, they want to give something to think about for the rest of the week. But this is some deeper stuff. And preachers are always told, don't get into the weeds, don't get into this deep stuff. Prop them up, feel good, and send them out the door. Well, take a look at the church today. They're pumped up, feel good, and there's no spirit in this world. No spirit of power and authority. It's because we failed to teach our children the solid base of the faith. So it's time we get into that. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep going through Daniel, if you're all okay with that. If you're not, tell, tell me so, and we'll find something else. But that's what I want you to understand. This is what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
is because these things are going to become important as the days grow closer to that day. And we need to know the old, the original, before we understand fully what Jesus is saying in the Newer Testament. If you don't know Daniel and the rest, you won't understand Revelation. So let's know the whole of the Bible. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Almighty God, I want to thank you today for your holy word and how it doesn't change. You don't change. You work the same way from the beginning of time to the end of time. There's no shadow of turning with you. Help us to fully understand your word. As we leave here as a group of people, help us to read and study. And be. And Lord, I pray that you will reveal Scripture to each and every one of us. Lord, your Scripture is inspired, breathed out. And we need you to help us fully understand. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You now stand and join in singing as we go.